Today we have our two guests, Sami Zachary and David Wood. Both are experienced debaters who have debated many times in the past, uh, and each of them runs run their own websites and have been active in the field of apologetics for many years now. In the interest of time, um, I will leave that as the bios, just to give you some idea of the format of how, how tonight is going to run. Both speakers will have a 20-minute uh, opening statement, followed by 10-minute rebuttals, 5-minute rebuttals, and then a half an hour for question and answer sessions. You'll find that you have scattered around somewhere, maybe there aren't enough of them, but there's papers to write in questions, but there'll also be opportunity to ask questions uh, aloud. Um, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Andrew Wilson, the Imperial College Chaplain, for being with us today, who's going to be the co-chair, and I'd like to invite him to say a few words as well. Thank you. No. <laughs> thank you for the invitation to come and co-chair. Um, to have people from different faiths debating is one thing, to have people from different faiths ensuring good order is a good thing. Um, it's National Interfaith Week, so it's great that we're doing this. There are two people I'm reading at the moment who interest me about interfaith. One is from America, a Muslim, Ibo Patel, who's the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. He's doing a lot of work in American universities and high schools to promote dialogue and understanding. Great influence, and I was really pleased to hear him speak in America in the summer. And he talks about the interfaith triangle. You need to know people, you need to find out about other people's <coughs> faith, and you need to develop good attitudes in order to create good understanding between people of different faiths. And the more times you go around the triangle in a positive way, the deeper the understanding gets. Of course, you can go around it in a, in a really, really negative way towards racism and violence and misunderstanding, but I'm sure tonight we're going around the interfaith triangle in a positive way. And the other person is Brian McLaren, the evangelical Christian, also I think coming from America, highly respected, who's talking a lot now about Christians developing a strong Christian identity, but one that's open and engaged rather than brittle or defensive. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting Christian voice. And I, I think it's kind of the Christian version of some good Muslim voices that I've also been reading. So I hope you find something tonight that you're going to be able to take away that's going to increase your knowledge and your understanding. So for good listening, I suppose, is my prayer tonight. Good listening and good understanding. And uh, searching for the common ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that nice welcome. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Sami Zachary, uh, who is going to be going first, as was previously decided. Um, I'll give a, a two-minute warning, or would you like five-minute warning? I'll time myself. You'll, you'll have your own timer. Okay. So, they'll, so we'll keep that for, uh, under 20 minutes. So, without further ado, Brother Sami Zachary. Thank you, first of all, to the Imperial ISOC for agreeing to host tonight's uh, discussion. You've been very helpful in helping organize it and promote it, so we much appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank uh, David Wood for making this trip all the way from America. Uh, myself and Wood have already debated this year in America, so I'm sure he'd agree that this feels like such a different world from where we debate the structures, the architecture, everything. So I kind of like that. I find that interesting. But nonetheless, as to the topic for tonight's discussion, um, the message of Muhammad and the message of Jesus, you know, was there a conflict or conciliation between the two? You know, did their messages overlap with one another or are there stark differences between their message? And when I talk about message, I'm talking about their main message, the core doctrine of what they taught. There's always going to be slight differences in uh, small issues here and there, such as uh, judicial matters, there probably would have been a small difference. 
But when I talk about similarity, I'm talking about the core message, not side issues. So the main messages of both these men. And so let's start with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What was his message? And essentially, what is the message of Islam? And is it similar to what Jesus taught? Now, the main message that the Prophet Muhammad brought was very simple, that there is only one God, and that this one God created all of us, and that we should worship Him, the pure, essential monotheism of God. In fact, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent his own missionaries abroad, for example, uh, the Prophet sent one of his companions, uh, Mu'ad, he sent him to a Christian community, and the Prophet commanded him, the first thing you should do when you give them the message of Islam is teach them about the monotheism of God, basically that there is only one God who created us, and that this one God should be worshipped. So that is one of the main aspects of Islam. But now, in Islam, it's not simply about believing that there is only one true God and worshipping the one true God. Uh, accompanied with belief is actions. Now, it's often been said uh, incorrectly that Islam is a faith that relies on works alone. So sometimes some people say that in order to be saved according to Islam, you have to have more good deeds than bad deeds, and then you'll be saved. So it's basically all to do with actions. Now, that is incorrect, because according to the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran, which was revealed to him, Islam is combined of both faith and your righteous deeds. And this comes from the Quran itself in chapter 2, verses 225 where God says and give glad tidings to those who believe and do righteous deeds and the Prophet himself said in an authentic narration he clearly told the Muslims that do good deeds do good actions but know that your actions alone will not be able to save you so the Prophet even said that your actions alone aren't enough to save you. So therefore anybody who argues that Islam is a faith of actions only is quite incorrect. Islam is a combination of deeds and faith. Faith in the one God who created us and who we should worship. Now connected to worship is following God's ways. You know, part of worship is to follow God's regulations. You know, live your life according to God. That's what many people say. And so, for example, in Islam, we follow the zakat, which is a, cha a charity tax. We give a part of our income to the poor, a percentage of our income to the poor. So that is following a law and regulation of God. That is an aspect of worship. So when we say we believe in one God, and that this only one true God should be worshipped, when we say worship, we don't simply mean prayers or fasting, we mean following God's regulation, rules, and laws. That is a major aspect of worship, and you need to keep that in mind, because that's going to come up very shortly when it comes to Jesus himself. So, to summarize the main message of the Prophet Muhammad, there is only one God, that this one true God created all of us, and that we should all worship this one true God, Accompanied with this belief is the actions we do, good deeds. And fifthly, an aspect of worshipping God, which is also fundamental, is following His rules, regulations, and laws. And that's basically the main message of Islam. Obviously, I could go and talk much further in depth, but since time is limited, that's an accurate summary of what Islam teaches. Very simple. And in fact, if Islam is a faith from God, we would expect its main doctrine to be very simple rather than overly complicated. Now, on to Jesus. What was the message of Jesus? Well, let's start with what the Quran says, and then we'll move to what the Gospels say. So, what's Jesus' main message according to Islam? Well, the Quran tells us plainly and clearly in two verses, in chapter 5, verse 72 and chapter 3 verse 51 as chapter 3 verse 51 says it is Allah who is my Lord and your Lord 
and worship Him, and that is a straight path. And in chapter 5, verse 72, it quotes Him saying, O children of Israel, worship God, your Lord and my Lord, and don't join anyone else in worship to Him, and that is the way to salvation. So according to the Qur'an, the message of Jesus was just like the message of the Prophet Muhammad. Worship one God, don't associate any partners with that God, and that is the straight path. And that God is my God and your God. You know, the one who created us all, as the Qur'an says. We were created by the one true God. We all have the same Creator. So that's what the Qur'an says about Jesus. He taught pure monotheism, like the Prophet Muhammad. But now the question is, what do the Gospels say about that? Do the Gospels say the same thing when it comes to the main core doctrine of Jesus? And the answer is very simple. It's a yes. There's a very interesting verse in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Mark. It's a very interesting incident in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 33. Jesus is approached by a scribe and teacher of the law, basically a Jewish uh, scholar, you can say. And this man asks Jesus a question, because they were all testing Jesus. Uh, they wanted to catch him out to try and expose him as a false teacher and false um, prophet and false messiah. And so the teacher came up to Jesus and plainly asked him, um, what is the most important commandment? You know, what's the most important message? And you know, that's the smoking gun right there. That's the litmus test. What did Jesus say? Did Jesus tell him the most important commandment is to believe that I, Jesus, am God, your creator, who created you to worship me? No. Did Jesus tell him that the most important commandment is to believe that I, Jesus, will die and be sacrificed for your sins on a cross? The answer is no. So what did Jesus say? He said the most important commandment is that the Lord, our God, is one God, and that you should follow Him. Very interesting, because that's what the Prophet Muhammad taught, and that's what the Quran says Jesus taught, and as I also said, that's the most important main message in Islam, to believe in the one God. And lo and behold, Jesus himself in the Gospels, not in the Quran, not in some book written by an Islamic scholar, but in the Gospels, Jesus is saying the most important commandment is to believe in the one true God and to follow him. More interesting, when Jesus talked about how to be saved as well, once again, a man comes up to Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. A man comes and talks to Jesus and he asks him plainly, how can I be saved? Very important question to tonight's discussion because once again, it's all right there. The litmus test, the smoking gun. How can I be saved? What was Jesus' answer? You can be saved by believing that I, Jesus, am God? No. Did he say you can be saved by believing that I, Jesus, will die and rise for uh, your sins? No. He told them to follow the commandments. In fact, he said, you know the commandments. You follow them. And the man said, yes. And Jesus simply told them, you lack one more thing. And what was that one more thing? It wasn't that now you should believe on God or should, be, or should believe that I'm going to die for you. He simply told them, give up your possessions, because he was a rich man. Give up your possessions and give it for the poor. And that's the only thing the rich man couldn't do. So according to Jesus, salvation is linked to actions. Because part of the commandments aren't simply belief, but they're also actions. And just like the Prophet Muhammad, just like the Quran, salvation is linked to both deeds and faith. As Jesus made it clear right here, if you want to be saved, follow the commandments. And earlier, Jesus said that the most important command is to believe that your God is one God. Very Islamic. And this isn't the only place in the Gospels. If you read the Gospels for yourself, there are many other verses in the Gospels where Jesus tells his people to do good actions and that they'll be saved and judged by their actions, not, sim not simply based on their faith. 
just like Islam teaches the people. But I'm not sure what David Wood will be thinking because he's brought this up in the past. And not just David, other Christians might be thinking the same thing. Well, how does it make sense that Jesus' main message was to worship the one true God and that there was only one God? You know, these are not pagans. These are Israelites. These are people who already have the Ten Commandments. These are people who already have the Torah, which tells them that God is one. You know, he's not preaching to Greek pagans who are mixed with polytheism and worshiping idols and several gods. So how does it make sense that Jesus' main message and what he was sent for was to preach something that the people already knew about, that uh, they worship one God or they believe in one God? Well, as I earlier said, monotheism isn't simply believing that there is one true God. If that makes you a monotheist, and if that's good enough, then Satan is a monotheist. In fact, Satan would be the best monotheist because he's more, he's more certain than any of us that God surely exists. So he's probably a better monotheist than most other people. But does that mean anything? Because Satan is a monotheist and he believes that there is only one God? Obviously not. Connected to believing that there is only one God is to also worship that one God. And as I earlier said, worship or an aspect of worshiping God isn't simply to pray, but it is also to follow God's rules, regulations, and laws. And now here we come to the question, were the Israelites of Jesus' community, specifically the establishment, the people who were in charge of the Jewish community, you know, the people who would make the fatwas, you can say, the uh, scholars and so forth, were they following the laws and regulations of God? Were they doing it correctly? I'll let Jesus answer the question for us, and he does so. In Mark chapter 7, verses 6 to 9, Jesus calls them hypocrites, and then he goes to explain why he calls them hypocrites. According to Jesus, and this is what he says, For you have laid the commandments of God in order to uphold your own man-made traditions. And then he goes further. He says, You reject the commandment of God so that you can keep your own traditions. So according to Jesus, the establishment of his community, the religious establishment of his community, rejected the commandment of God in favor of their own man-made traditions, which is true. If anybody studies the, the history of the Jewish establishment or the Jewish religious establishment, one of the main fundamentals of their faith is this oral traditional law, which a lot of aspects of it have nothing to do with the Old Testament. And then in Mark chapter 7, continuing in verse 13, Jesus says it clearly, that you have made the word of God into no effect with your own man-made tradition. So, does that sound like these people don't need a prophet to remind them of the true monotheism of God? Or does this show that these people are in dire need of a prophet to remind them of the true monotheism of God? As he said, you reject the commandment of God in favor of your own man-made tradition. In essence, they turn themselves into gods and reject the true commandments of God in their own book. Coincidentally, the Qur'an says the same thing in chapter 9. And this is very interesting. The Qur'an said that the Jews took their uh, rabbis and their leaders as lords. And so Jewish converts to Islam, there were many rabbis who converted to Islam, and they came to the Prophet and they told them, but we don't understand this verse in the Qur'an that is accusing us of worshipping others. We were Jews. We worshipped the one true God. And then the Prophet told them, as Jesus told them, yes, the way you worshipped your rabbis and your scholars was by following their laws and traditions in place of God. And that's how you made them your gods. Just like Jesus told them in the Gospels. So remember, worship is connected to following God's laws and regulations. And as we've clearly seen in the Gospel, Jesus accuses His people or the religious establishment of not doing so. Now, 
That is what I believe Jesus' main message is, that he preached the true monotheism of God to get his people back on the right path. As he said, he came preaching about the kingdom of God. And how do you get into the kingdom of God? It's not by being a bad monotheist. It's not by throwing the commandment of God to the side. It's by following the commandment of God. But now, David will obviously disagree with this. He partially disagree. He, I think he'll agree that Jesus taught monotheism. But David will go on to say, but that wasn't his only main message. David will argue that the other main message of Jesus was that he came to die for our sins. So that's the crucial point of Jesus' message. And that's where we disagree. So, was Jesus' main message about the cross? Did he actually come to die for us? Well, there's a big problem, because according to this doctrine, Jesus came to die for our sins, because only a sacrifice on the cross can atone for our sins. You know, we can't be forgiven without the shedding of blood. You know, what happens to sin? It just can't stay there. But there's a problem with that because sins were already being forgiven before Jesus ever got crucified. So if sins could be forgiven already without Jesus getting crucified, then the crucifixion isn't really necessary. It's not bringing anything new. Sin could have been atoned for without bloodshed, without a human sacrifice. For example, the baptism. John the Baptist, he was around before Jesus, committing his baptisms in the river of Jordan in Mark chapter 1 verses 4 to 5 and according to the gospel what was the baptism the baptism was to remove people's sins you know it was to make them holy again or born again and coincidentally Jesus got baptized but if he wasn't sinless then why would he need to get baptized that's a topic for another day so baptisms were already forgiving sins and here's the biggest irony. In Mark chapter 2, verse 5, many Christians often bring this verse up to prove that Jesus is God. For example, uh, Jesus forgave people of their sins. But think about that. Jesus forgave people of their sins before He was crucified. So if Jesus could, for, uh, could simply forgive people of their sins without a crucifixion, then that proves you don't need the cross, because he simply said, your sins are forgiven. Though he said that God gave him the power to forgive sin, he didn't own it. But nonetheless, the main point is, is that if Jesus could simply forgive somebody of their sins without being on the cross, then the cross is not necessary. Last but not least, you as a Christian can forgive people of their sins, or you can remove your own sins by yourself. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 15, the Lord's Prayer, when you pray according to Jesus, what did He teach you? He said, when you pray, forgive other people in your prayers, and then God will forgive you. Very simple. So, according to Jesus, you can remove your sin by simply forgiving somebody else. Once again, sin is being removed without the necessity of a cross. So if Jesus' main message is about the cross, well, as I said, it doesn't make sense because there was already a system in place to remove sin. And if Jesus is the only way, His sacrifice is the only way to be saved, then what about all the people beforehand and my time is up? while I turn the prediction off, if uh, anyone would like to come to the front to take a seat, please do. Um.
Okay, thank you for your kind attention during that uh, opening statement. Okay, if we just could settle down again, please. Stretch your legs or when we finish. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. David Wood. I'd like to thank the uh, Imperial College Islamic Society for uh, hosting our debates as well as the Muslim Debate Initiative for uh, putting this series together and uh, of course my friend Sammy for representing the Muslim position. Um, I've been studying the lives of Jesus and Muhammad on and off since 1994, first as an atheist and later as a Christian. I don't think that anyone can really understand the world around us without uh, understanding uh, the messages of Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, so I look forward to our exchange tonight. Uh, Sammy and I are going to be disagreeing uh, a lot tonight, but I, I do want to just uh, acknowledge here at the beginning that uh, Christians and Muslims do agree on a number of issues. We agree that there is one God, uh, all-knowing, all-powerful infinite, uh, perfect, and good. We agree um, that God has sent messengers into the world, that God created the world, that God will ultimately judge the world. Concerning Jesus, we agree that he was born of a virgin. It's important to keep, th keep these things in mind. Who agrees with Christians that Jesus was born of a virgin? It's Muslims, right? Um, we agree that uh, Jesus performed all kinds of miracles, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus spoke the truth. We agree uh, on a lot of things. Uh, and so we have to keep these things in mind, uh, but for now, uh, we do have some differences. And uh, Sammy's the one saying, hey, we agree on everything, and uh, you know, most things. I, 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 I have to be the bad guy here and say uh, we disagree on a lot of things, and there are some important reasons. And the, the issues we normally disagree on concern some, some issues with the nature of God, the identity of Jesus, the way to salvation, and some issues about how we are to live our lives. Now, where do these differences uh, really come from? Why is it that a Christian uh, certainly believes different things from a Muslim? And I would say it's actually uh, very simple. This is, uh, this is a Bible, this is a Quran, and if you open them up and start reading, uh, you get some similarities, but you also get some important uh, differences in the messages in these two books. And so one of the important things that's going to come up is how we uh, try to reconcile them. Sammy goes to the Bible and, and tries to harmonize it with the teachings of the Quran, and um, that certainly works with some teachings of the Bible, uh, but we're going to look at a few more things. Uh, so let's look at some of the things Jesus says in the Gospel, and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just read some passages for you. Uh, in Mark 9.31, Jesus tells his disciples, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Uh, so Jesus says he's going to be killed, and that he's going to rise again after he's been killed. Uh, but according to Islam, Jesus never died, and therefore didn't rise from the dead. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 10.45, Sammy doesn't think this is a very important uh, part of Jesus' message, but Jesus says in uh, Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says that he has come to, to give his life as a ransom for others. So this is, these are not my words, these are Jesus' words. Uh, Jesus claims that he's going to lay down his life as a ransom for others. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus says, 
All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. In this single, in this single verse, Jesus claims that he owns everything, all things have been handed over to him, that he is the divine Son of God, that the Father is the only one who truly knows him, and that people can only know the Father through him. Uh, not the sort of thing we would expect Jesus to say, given what we read about him in the Quran, given what Sammy quoted to us from the Quran. In John 17, 5, Jesus claims that he existed with the Father before the world was created. He said, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. After his resurrection from the dead, Jesus did receive this glory that he had before creation. We read in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Uh, this is after he rose from the dead. Uh, the passage reads, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now think about what you have in this passage. Jesus says that he has all authority, not only on earth, all authority in heaven and on earth. His followers, his followers are to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says he's going to be with his followers wherever they are, even to the end of the age. This doesn't sound like a mere prophet to me. As far as future events are concerned, in John 5, 25 to 29, Jesus says that at the resurrection, the dead are going to rise when they hear his voice. Listen to his words. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Not only is Jesus going to raise the dead for their final judgment, he's also going to be the one who judges them. That's what he claims. In Matthew 25, 31 to 32, Jesus says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the, as the shepherd separates, them, uh, separates the sheep from the goats. He goes on in that passage to say that he's the one who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Uh, what mere prophet could ever claim that after he speaks and raises the dead, he gets to judge uh, judge people and decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Uh, these are the sorts of things we read about Jesus in the gospel. The, design, the, the divine son lays aside his glory that he had from all eternity. He enters the world to die as a ransom for sins. After he dies, he rises from the dead, gets that glory back, and will eventually uh, resurrect and judge all of us. Yes, Jesus said lots of other things, things that Sammy pointed out, but this is the message of Jesus, and we can't kind of pick and choose here what we like to believe. Now, nearly six centuries after Jesus made these claims, uh, Muhammad came along and preached uh, a, a message that was similar in certain ways and very different in other ways. Uh, I agree with, with Sammy that um, kind of the overall message of Islam uh, is fairly easy to understand. I would, I would summarize the message of Islam uh, in kind of two steps. One, you need to submit to God. I would agree with that step. You need to submit to God. That's sort of part one. Uh, part two, the rest of the message, is how you do that. So how do I submit to, to God? How do I submit to Allah? 
And here's where you have uh, the teachings of uh, the Quran and the Hadith. You submit to Allah by obeying uh, Allah's commands in the Quran and Muhammad's commands in the Hadith. Um, but it's, uh, the Quran puts a lot of emphasis on just how diligent you have to be in obeying uh, Muhammad. According to the Quran, you can't have any faith unless you uh, completely accept Muhammad's decisions. Uh, in Surah 4, verse 65, Allah tells people they can have no faith until they make Muhammad the judge in their disputes and do not resist, have no resistance to Muhammad's decisions. So Surah 4, verse 65 reads, But know by your Lord they can have no faith until they make you, Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. So part of submitting, part of having that full submission is making Muhammad the judge in all disputes. Uh, part of submitting to Allah is submitting fully to Muhammad. In Surah 33, 36, Allah says that when Allah and Muhammad have made a decision, uh, the believer has no option about that decision. So here we read, it is not fitting for a believer, man or woman, when a matter has been decided by Allah and his apostle to have any option about their decision. If anyone disobeys Allah and his apostle, he is indeed on a clearly wrong path. So you submit to Allah, not only by believing in the six articles of faith, not only by uh, performing the five pillars, but by opening the Quran and the Hadith and believing the things that you're required to believe and uh, doing the things you're required to do without resistance and without objection. But now we have a problem. Part of Muhammad's message, part of the things that you are required to believe as a Muslim without objecting, is that Jesus spoke the truth, that Jesus is a true messenger. And what I mean here is, if I go to an atheist and I say, hey, atheist, Jesus said this, the atheist can say, I don't care. Who's he? Uh, but a Muslim and a Christian aren't allowed to say that sort of thing. We both agree whatever Jesus said we have to. Uh, we have to pay attention to that. Um, but as we've seen, the teachings of Jesus don't line up with the teachings of Muhammad on uh, several very important issues. Uh, Jesus claimed to be the divine son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead. Muhammad denied all of this. Uh, now think about this. Muhammad says, believe what Jesus said, and then contradicts what we read about what Jesus said. I only have two options here. I can either believe what Jesus said or I can uh, not believe what Jesus said. Right? Those are my two options. I can believe what Jesus said or I can not believe what Jesus said. Those are my choices. If I believe what Jesus said, about being the divine son of God who dies on the cross and rises from the dead, if I believe what Jesus said, then I have to reject Muhammad because Muhammad said those things aren't true. So if I look at what Jesus said and I said, I believe that, then I have to reject what Muhammad taught, because Muhammad taught something totally different. If, on the other hand, I say, well, I don't believe what Jesus said, I'm rejecting those claims by Jesus, then I also have to reject what Muhammad said, because he told me to believe what Jesus said. In other words, if I accept what Jesus said, I have to reject what Muhammad taught, and if I don't believe what Jesus said, I have to reject what Muhammad taught. Either way, no matter what I do here, I have to reject what Muhammad taught. Uh, for me, then, the main issue of our debate tonight is how we resolve the fact that Jesus and Muhammad taught radically different things. For the Christian, the solution is pretty simple. Thousands of people down through the ages have claimed to speak for God, have claimed to give us the truth about God. They can't all be right because lots of their messages contradict each other. If I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm going to listen to the one who rose from the dead. I mean, if anyone in history has God's stamp of approval on his message, I would say it's the one who rose from the dead. And so if I open up the teachings of the one who rose from the dead, and Muhammad comes along later and teaches something else, I have to say, I'm sorry, you're not the one who rose from the dead, I, I, and you contradict him, so I can't, uh, I can't accept what you're saying. Uh, but Muslims 
are going to take a different approach. Muslims are required to believe in both Jesus and Muhammad. So when Muhammad, uh, I mean, when Muslims open the Bible and find Jesus claiming that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, and that he's the final judge of all people, and that he's the one who will raise the dead at the resurrection, when Muslims read these things, they usually say corruption. The Bible's been corrupted. Um, those things were made up. Jesus never actually said them, so the dispute uh, evaporates. Uh, the problem with this response is that the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Gospel. The Quran affirms the inspiration of the Gospel, for instance, in Surah 3, 3 through 4. He has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it, and he revealed the Torah and the Gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Quran. So Allah revealed the Gospel as a guidance for mankind. What happened then? Did man corrupt it? Uh, not according to the Quran, he didn't. The Quran says that Christians still had the Gospel in Muhammad's time. In Surah 7, 157, we read, Those who follow the Messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the Law and the Gospel, it is they who will prosper. How do we find Muhammad in the Gospel if we don't have the Gospel? Uh, interestingly, when Muhammad was apparently having some doubts about his revelations, he was commanded to go to the people of the book for confirmation. Allah tells Muhammad in Surah 1094, But if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Mm -hmm. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. How is Muhammad going to check with the people of the book, people who've been reading the book, it says, if people don't have the book? Contrary to charges of corruption, uh, the Quran claims that no one, no one can corrupt Allah's word. This is Surah 18, verse 27. And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. There is none who can alter his words. Words. Who can corrupt Allah's words according to the Quran? The position of the Quran is you're not powerful enough. You can't do that. You can't stop Allah. There are certain times when I read the Quran, I go, wow, that's good theology. It's good theology. What human being can get in Allah's way? Uh, not surprisingly, as far as the Quran is concerned, the gospel is still authoritative scripture. Surah 5, verse 47, commands, command to Christians, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. That's interesting because lots of people say, don't go to the gospel, it's been corrupted. Allah says, go to the gospel or you're in rebellion against me. Judge by the gospel or you are a rebel. How can I judge by the gospel if I don't have the gospel or the gospel is uh, hopelessly corrupted and unreliable? <laughs> We find the same thing in Surah 5, verse 68. Say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the law, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. I have no ground to stand upon if I do not stand upon the gospel. How can I stand upon the gospel if it's been corrupted, if I don't have it, if it's gone? Is Allah telling me to do something I can't possibly do here? The only conclusion to draw is that I'm supposed to stand upon the gospel, that I'm supposed to judge by the gospel. So the Quran affirms the inspiration, saying it's revealed by Allah, the gospel is revealed by Allah, the preservation, no one can alter his words, and the authority of the gospel, that the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. But here we find the same problem that arose earlier. There are only two possibilities. Either the gospel, either, either what I have is the word of God or it's not. It's either the uncorrupted word of God or it's not. It's one or the other. If I have the uncorrupted word of God, I have to reject Muhammad's message because, as we've seen, Muhammad's message contradicts what I read here. So if this is the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad's message. 
Alternatively, if this isn't the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad's message because he said it was. So if this is the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad. If it's not the word of God, I have to reject Muhammad. Either way, I have to reject Muhammad. And therefore, I have to reject Muhammad. So this is where I find myself in examining uh, the message of Jesus and the message of Muhammad. <coughs> Jesus presented a message. Some people don't like it. Some people don't. <coughs> But at the end of the day, I have to say, he's the one who rose from the dead, I'm going to believe in him. Whatever he says, I'm going to believe. And then I turn to Islam, which denies many of the doctrines preached by the man who rose from the dead. And I have to say, well, who's right here? Who's right? But then I turn to the message of Muhammad, and I find him affirming, affirming the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the scriptures that tell me what Jesus taught. And so the message of Islam self-destructs in an important way by affirming scriptures that it contradicts. And so if I have to choose, I have to go with the message of Jesus. Thank you very much, Mr. David Wood. Uh, we will now go to the rebuttal section. So hand over 10 minutes to uh, Mr. Sahi. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of points. If I can address anything, then please uh, ask it in the Q&A, because I usually try to answer everything. But let's start with the last points, because they'll go into the discussion. The Quran affirms the Bible. It's true, the Quran does affirm the Bible and the uh, Torah. But nowhere in the Qur'an does it say it affirms the Gospels, or the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, uh, the Gospel of John, or the writings of uh, Paul. That doesn't exist in the Qur'an. When the Qur'an says it affirms the Bible, it's referring to the true scriptures that were originally revealed to who? To Moses and to Jesus. And guess what? It's a historical fact now, not according to Muslims, but to uh, textual critics of the Bible, that the Bible we have today is not the original uh, Bibles that were given to, supposedly given to Jesus. They're not even the copies of the original. So we don't have the originals. So when the Quran says follow or we believe in the Bible, it's talking about the original Bible that was given to Jesus and to Moses. Even in the Old Testament, the supposed books of Moses talk about his death and things that happened when he couldn't have been writing about it. So obviously, those weren't given to Moses. Secondly, when the Quran tells the people to judge by the Gospel or the Old Testament, we have examples of that during the Prophet's lifetime. So they need to be quoted in context. For example, once the Jews came to the Prophet and someone committed adultery. So they said, how should we be judged? And so the Prophet took their book and he pointed the commandment, according to your faith, you should be stoned. And they tried to hide it, but then he moved their hand. So it comes in context. It's simply referring to the true teachings that you can still follow that are in those books. And the Prophet showed it to them. There are still many regulations in those books which Jews can follow. Secondly, or thirdly, David doesn't seem to get it that the Qur'an is also using rhetorical devices here when it's telling the Jews to follow their own book because it's pointing their hypocrisy. Why are you coming to Islam telling us how we should judge when you have judgments in your own book? You know, you're the Jews. You say you're better than us in following God. So shouldn't you judge your book? And according to Jesus, remember in my opening, even he said, you made the book of God into nothing. So the Quran is even using rhetorical device here when it's saying, judge by your book. It's to show them their hypocrisy, that they're not even judging by their own book. So they shouldn't even be trying to pretend to be all righteous. And last but not least, we have a narration from a companion of the Prophet, narrated by Ibn Abbas, who quoted Omar. And what did he say? He said, why do you go to the Jews and Christians? Why do you go to their book when it has been revealed that their book has been corrupted and changed? So one of the companions of the Prophet is saying their book has been corrupted and changed. 
their book, not referring to the original one, which the Quran is referring to. And yes, nobody can truly uh, corrupt God's official world, a word. What you can do is you can make your own copy and say, this is from God. But you can't really corrupt the original work. You can simply uh, plagiarize and make your own books up. And guess what? People were doing that in early Christianity. It's, it's a fact. In the first three centuries, people would write their own gospel and say, yeah, this is from God. So it's very easy to make your own book and then say that's from God. And coincidentally, the Quran in chapter 2, verse 175, accuses them of doing so. They wrote the books with their own hands and then said this is from God. That's the book that the Quran condemns. And that's the book that Omar told the Muslims is corrupted. But the original books that aren't corrupted, which the Quran refers to, they don't even exist. Not only according to the Quran, but according to non-Muslim textual critics as well. Even Christian scholars admit that they don't have the original Bible. So now that's out of the way. But what about the first point he raised? Jesus predicted his own death, that he would die and rise in three days. I'll say bluntly that I don't believe those sayings are historical at all. I believe those are theologically interpolated verses that have been put into the Gospels after Jesus' supposed death. For example, the Gospel of Mark or Matthew, these were written decades after Jesus, after the events took place. So they would sometimes try to fit theology with supposed history. And this isn't simply my opinion. Uh, historical scholars on Jesus, for example, E.P. Sanders, one of the best scholars on the historical Jesus, he doesn't even find those sayings of Jesus supposedly saying, I'll rise and die in three days. And we can easily prove that they're not authentic. Because if Jesus predicted his death, then why were all the disciples shocked and saddened when he died? He told them he's going to die. He told them he's going to raise, be raised from the dead. But it seems nobody knew anything about it. They were all like shocked. Surely, if somebody crystal clearly told you that, hey, I'm going to die, and I'm going to die in Jerusalem, and I'm even going to die on this day, and then after three days, I'm going to rise, and then it all happens, supposedly, why would they still be shocked and surprised and saddened? There's a logical answer, because he never told them. Now it fits. Now it makes sense as to why everybody was surprised and shocked. And then the quotes about Jesus will judge the people. Well, I'm not even going to try to refute that. You know what? I'll concede that argument, but I'll flip it around. If Jesus is God because he judges, then his disciples are God as well. Because according to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus comes back, he's going to sit on the throne, but the 12 disciples will sit on the throne and judge everybody as well. So if we want to use your logic that Jesus must be God because he judged, then you need to add 12 more gods to your belief. So I'm not going to try to refute that because that works against you. And then the other point, um, Jesus will be with the people with all ages. You know, I'll be with you till the end of time. Now, there's one way you can interpret that, literally, as Woodward, that he's really physically present with you in all times. Or there's another simple way of Jesus saying, I'll be with you in all times. How can Jesus be with you all times? Very simple. He taught his people to follow his teachings. So in that sense, if you uphold the teachings of Jesus, in that sense, he is with you. Because you're carrying his example and his legacy. And then the point about uh, Islam, the prophet has to be our judge. You know, you can't, uh, you, faith is in Islam comes with believing in Muhammad. You know, you should make him your judge. You should uh, follow his commandments. And if you don't, uh, you can't be a Muslim. Well, that's true. Because the judgments of the prophet, and as the Quran said, it said judgments. It didn't refer to some personal issue. So, for example, if the prophet told you, I think you should farm like that, you didn't really have to uh, command that. That's just a personal issue. But when it came to religious matters, in terms of uh, laws and regulations, then yes. Because who was, whose law was the prophet Muhammad using when he used to judge people? 
when the Quran says judge between the disputes, the Prophet wasn't coming up with his own uh, laws by himself. He was coming up with the laws of God. He was following God's laws in implementing those judgments. So when the Quran says follow the judgment of Muhammad, it's because the judgment of Muhammad is based on God's law. So you're basically following God's law by doing that. And remember in the opening statement, Jesus condemns his people for making their own laws. And that's what the prophet even condemned people for. So his laws and his judgments are based on God. You know, the sunnah of the prophet. The sunnah of the prophet isn't a man-made regulation that he comes up with. It's from God. And the last point... Um, I, David says that he should believe the person who rises from the dead. Why should I believe the Prophet Muhammad? I'll believe the person who rises from the dead. Well, we can argue that, quite frankly, there actually is no strong historical evidence that Jesus ever rose from the dead. I had that debate uh, two months ago. There's no strong evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. That's an issue of faith. But Christians cannot uh, prove it with, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so I believe those were his main point. The point in John, uh, Jesus pre-existed in God's glory. Um, yes, figuratively, we all existed in God's foreknowledge and so forth. And very interestingly, two verses before that, Jesus says that there's only one true God. So how can he be God at the same time? Sammy. Um, Sammy says that uh, the Quran does affirm the gospel, but nowhere does it affirm the four gospels or the writings of Paul. It affirms the original revelations given to Moses and to Jesus. Um, the gospel is exactly how the four gospels were referred to during the time of Muhammad. This goes back to Ignatius in 115, where the four Gospels were from then on treated as a lump. It was, they weren't called, we call them today the four, the four Gospels. Back then they were called the fourfold Gospel. That's how it was referred to from the second century on, to, on through the time of Muhammad. So when you said the Gospel to a Christian, that's what the Gospel was. That's what the Gospel was. So why would Allah tell Christians to judge by the Gospel, knowing how we're going to interpret that, knowing what that means to a Christian, right? This would be like, uh, suppose a prophet came along and said, you Muslims, judge by the Quran. And then walks away and says, by, by the way, I, when I say Quran, I mean something totally different than anything you're ever, you've ever seen. It wouldn't make any sense. You'd say, you need to be a little more clear. Uh, similarly, if God is coming to Christians saying, you judge by the gospel. Well, that, that means something to a Christian. That means the gospel that we have. That means the fourfold gospel. And that's exactly what I've done in this debate. I judge the claims of Muhammad by the claims in the gospel. He says, well, we don't have the original manuscripts of the gospel. Well, true, we don't have the original manuscripts uh, of the Quran. What's the point? The question is whether it's been preserved accurately. <laughs> now, if we're talking about the Quran, according to Muslim sources, there were all kinds of changes in the Quran. Entire chapters were lost. Large sections were lost. Individual verses were lost. There were a couple of verses. Aisha had the only copy, and she says her sheep came and ate them. The verse of stoning and the verse of breastfeeding an adult ten times. They're supposed to be in the Quran. They're not there. Where'd they go? Aisha, said, Aisha says her sheep ate them. With that, with that, I will say, I wouldn't say that the Quran has been corrupted. Right? I think some things, some things were, uh, were, were deleted along the way. I wouldn't say corrupted. Why? Because I believe that the, the message has been preserved. The message of the Quran has been preserved. And that's exactly what I always say about the Bible. Yes, you have textual variants, you have scribes making mistakes and so on, but you can compare manuscripts. We have around 6,000 Greek manuscripts. You can compare them, and when someone makes a mistake, you can generally spot it. And so obviously, I would say, the message of the Bible has not been corrupted. So we have to be uh, fair in our standards here. If you're going to say we don't have the original manuscripts, therefore it's a problem, well, then we've got a problem with Islam, and we have another reason to reject Muhammad's message. 
Sammy says that when the Quran tells people to judge by the Torah or the Gospel, um, we have examples of this in the Muslim sources. And I think this is, a, this is a huge point, but this doesn't go in Sammy's favor. The story that he referred to about the, the, the issue of adultery, in that story, Muhammad says, bring me a copy of the Torah. And when they bring out the Torah, Muhammad says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. He's talking to the Torah that was brought out, the actual copy that was brought out by the Jews. He said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Wait a minute, I thought the scriptures had been corrupted. What's he doing talking to an actual manuscript saying he believes in it? This only makes sense if this was the actual, uh, the actual Torah. And this fits in with what we know, um, with what we know from the Quran. Um, Sammy says that the Quran is using rhetorical devices when, he, when it says, uh, why are you coming to Muhammad when you have your own book? Uh, this is a very important passage. I, I invite uh, everyone to read it. It's sort of 5 verses 43 through 48. And what you find there, you don't find rhetorical devices. The Jews come to Muhammad to judge a dispute, and the Quran's response is, why are you coming to Muhammad when you have the Torah? And then it goes down to verse 47, and it says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If you fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, you're no better than those who rebel. Is it a rhetorical device to say, you Christians had better judge by the gospel, or you are a rebel? That's not, just a, that's not a rhetorical device. It's telling me I'm in trouble if I don't judge by the gospel. That's what I'm doing tonight. And by the way, the next verse, that's where it says that Muslims judge by the Quran. So the picture you find here is, Jews, they have their Torah. It's inspired. It's preserved. It's authoritative. The Christians have their scripture, the gospel, and the Muslims have the Quran. And so everyone needs to judge by their scriptures. Well, I'm a Christian, so I'm commanded to judge by the gospel. And by the way, if it's just, I mean, if this is just a rhetorical device of some kind, think about the other verse I quoted. You have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Torah and the gospel. That sounds like, I mean, a, a serious threat to me. If I don't judge by the gospel, it doesn't sound like Allah is playing with words or something. Uh, Sammy says that Ibn, Ibn Abbas uh, said that Umar said that the Bible has been corrupted. Well, that's a problem for Umar. He contradicts what the Quran says very clearly, um, that no one can corrupt Allah's word, and that the gospel is still authoritative. Eventually, Muslims did look into what the Bible actually says, and many of them concluded, well, this must have been corrupted, but that's not the position of Muhammad himself. Um, Sammy says, well, it, it just means Allah's original word. It's the original. Well, if it's only the original, and what we have today is different from the original, then Allah's word has been corrupted. The Quran says no one can corrupt Allah's word. So is the Quran wrong there? If it's been corrupted, if it's the only original, then I don't have it now. How can I judge by it? How can I stand upon it? I have no ground to stand upon unless I stand upon it, and I'm a rebel if I don't judge by it. How can I do that if it's the original that's now lost? Sammy says, Surah 2 accuses people of writing their own books. Indeed, it does. And he's right. That did happen. That happened uh, in Judaism. It was collected into books that were uh, part of the, the Talmud and so on. Uh, it happened among Christians. Uh, Muslims came up with fabricated hadith. People can always, always, always invent false stories. The claim of the Quran is the Torah cannot, itself cannot be corrupted. The Gospel cannot be corrupted. The Quran cannot be corrupted. And they all are all authoritative according to Islam. Uh, Sammy says that Jesus never said he would die by crucifixion. This was an interpolation. So the gospel has been corrupted, right? Jesus never said he was going to die by crucifixion. Never said he was going to die by crucifixion. Someone else wrote that later. And that's essential to the gospel. If you look at the book of Acts, that was part of the, the, the core message of Christianity. Jesus died on the cross for his sins. If that never happened, then the entire gospel message has been corrupted. And the Quran would be wrong when it says no one can corrupt the gospel. Um, as far as this being interpolated, think about it. From an Islamic perspective, why was it ever written back into the Bible, according to an Islamic perspective? Why would it have been written in the Bible that Jesus died on the cross? Where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died on the cross, according to Islam? According to Islam, Christians got the idea that Jesus died on the cross from Allah. Surah 4, 157. They said they killed the Messiah, but they didn't kill him. It was made to appear to them that way. It was made to appear to them that way. So according to the standard Muslim interpretation, who was actually crucified, Judas. Allah took Judas, disguised him, made him look like Jesus. Then Judas was put on the cross. Judas was crucified, but everyone thought 
that it was Jesus. So Jesus' followers eventually come to conclude that Jesus died on the cross. Why? Because Allah tricked them. So the reason, according to Sammy's perspective, the reason we open the Bible and find that Jesus died on the cross is that Allah tricked his followers into believing he died on the cross, and then they believed it and wrote it back into the gospel, which can't be corrupted. Starting to see some problems here. Uh, Sammy said, uh, with the claim that, that Jesus will judge the people, Sammy says, well, if Jesus is God because he judges, then the disciples will judge, uh, uh, will, will be gods as well, because they are going to judge. We have to clarify two different kinds of judgment here. There are judges all over London. There are judges all over the UK. There are all kinds of judges. It's not the kind of judgment we're talking about when someone says, I'm the one who stands at the judgment on the throne and decides who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That is a specific kind of judgment, which, according to the Quran and the Bible, is something only God does. Jesus says he's the one who's going to do it. That's not the same thing. Um, as far as Jesus saying uh, that he will be with his people for all times, Sammy says, well, this just means his teachings will be with them. Well, Jesus was a very bad communicator, according to Sammy, then, because no one walked away with that. No one walked away. Oh, he's just saying his teachings will be with them. This is right after he says he has all authority on earth and in heaven, and that Christians have to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says he's going to be with his, with his followers forever. If, if, if he, Jesus didn't mean any of that, if all of that meant something else, Jesus uh, should not be exalted by anyone. We should say, wow, this guy is the worst, most unclear speaker in history. Don't believe anything he says because he didn't know how to communicate. Uh, Sammy says, when it comes to religious matters, yes, people must submit to, Allah, to Muhammad's decisions. And now we're getting down to the, to the reason I... I uh, brought all this up. What the Quran says, that's a religious matter. Muhammad, uh, Muhammad says, you've got to submit to that. The Quran says, have to submit to that. Well, the Quran says, God revealed the gospel as a guidance for man, that no one can corrupt Allah's word, that Christians have no ground to stand upon if we don't stand upon the gospel. I open up the gospel, it doesn't line up with Islam. So if I obey the Quran's command to believe the gospel, I have to reject Islam. And so again, I'm confronted with the decision. I can either believe the one who rose from the dead, or I can believe the message that self-destructs upon uh, this kind of examination. Thank you. We're now going to have final five-minute summaries or rebuttals from both speakers. Which will be followed by the question and answer session. So, if you want to get writing or get thinking of what you're going to say, uh, then that would be this is a good time to do that. Um, so it's time. All right, lots of points to get to. Now, the first point when the Quran says the gospel, early Christians understood the gospel as all gospels. Well now, he's trying to say when the Qur'an says that, it means what we Christians said. No, that's not what it meant. When the Qur'an says the Gospel, it's referring to the original Gospel. When Christians said the Gospel, it wasn't referring to the original Gospel, it was referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So very big difference in how both are approaching the situation. And I'm happy, we have affirmed that one of the companions of the Prophet, not just Omar, but Ibn Abbas, a relative of the Prophet, and the Prophet even said, go to him because he knows the Qur'an. Both of these men said that the Bible is corrupted. And they didn't just make this up. They based that uh, interpretation, they based that teaching on the verse, Surah 2, verse 175, which is talking about the Bible. If you read it in context, it's talking about the Israelites and how they corrupted their Bible. And so Omar ibn Abbas, Say, you see, why are you going to them? Their book is corrupted. Where's the evidence? That verse. So that's what you call harmonizing things. So yeah, they, they were just all wrong. You know, the, the companions were wrong. The Bible wasn't really corrupted. 2,000 years later, evangelical missionaries come to us and tell us, yeah, you should believe in the Bible because your Quran says it's preserved. How come none of them understood it that way? So I'm glad he concedes that they believe that. This isn't just something Muslims have made up. So when, and back to the other point, when the Quran talks about the original gospel and the Torah, it is not referring to what you have. How do we know? The Quran says so, and the companion said so as well. 
And as for bringing the Torah to the Prophet, and he said, I believe in it, now you're attacking a straw man, because there's not a single Muslim I know, nor have I even said this, no Muslim says that the entire Torah you have today is completely corrupt. Fundamentally, a Muslim would still say that, yeah, that book is from God. But we don't completely believe in it. So when the Prophet said that, yeah, this book is from God, that doesn't really hurt my case because I never said that the entire book was corrupt. But that isn't the entire book that the Qur'an is referring to. And when the Prophet judged by the Torah, we know what specific law he used, which was the law of stoning. So therefore, as a Muslim, we know that that is one of the authentic teachings. So that point is out. Now, what about manuscripts? Uh, the Qur'an doesn't have original manuscripts. This is a big difference. You're comparing apples and oranges. The Qur'an doesn't need manuscripts. Even if you burned every single Qur'an today, we'd still have a Qur'an. Why? Because of oral memorization. The Bible's entire textual integrity is linked to text, not to oral law. So that's even quite uh, a big deceptive argument if you think about it. So we don't rely on a manuscript tradition, and we have first century manuscripts anyway. And if you study the preservation of the Qur'an, the Qur'an's copies was based on an original manuscript that was made by who? Abu Bakr. When the original Bible was made, we don't know who made it. We don't even have the original manuscript. And David said, when you compare two manuscripts together, that's false. You're comparing two manuscripts that aren't even based on the original. So you're comparing two manuscripts based on a copy, which isn't even the original, and based on a copy, we don't even know who wrote. Now that's a big problem. So that's why you don't have the original manuscripts. You don't even have the original copy. Now if you didn't have the original manuscripts, but you had a copy of the original, then you have a point, but you don't even have the copy. That's why many Bible scholars even say that today any talk of uh, coming close to the original text of the Bible is virtually impossible. Even with all the manuscripts you have, you cannot. And you all study in Imperial College, they teach you this if you study it. You can go to the library and find these books. This is basic academia, not by Muslims, but by non-Muslim textual critics. But the points remain about Jesus rising from the dead, because that's the main difference between us. All this is irrelevant. Jesus said, I will rise from the dead. I already showed you why there's problems with that, because nobody expected it. And textual uh, historians, such as E.P. Sanders, reject those teachings as being historical. Not a Muslim, but a non-Muslim is saying that those teachings are not authentic. As for uh, the disciples judging, well, their judgment is different. How convenient. I can say Jesus' judgment is different as well, because according to him, he was given the power. So even if he does judge, it's not his judgment. Sammy. Um, Sammy says that when the Quran says the gospel, it's referring to the original gospel, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That would be perfectly fine if the only passage of the Quran I brought up is there are three, three through four, which says that the gospel was given as a revelation from God. Now, is that the only passage I brought up? According to Sammy's position, it seems, there was an original gospel, but now we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and we don't have that original gospel anymore. So the gospel has been corrupted into what we have now. This is what Christians mean when we say gospel. And so the word of God has been corrupted, contrary to Surah 1827 and Surah 6, 114 to 115, both of which declare no one can alter Allah's words. So the Quran is wrong, right? The Quran says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. Did Allah know that the gospel was gone, that it had been lost, that the original was lost, and that now when Christians here judge by the gospel, they're going to think, hey, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did Allah know that? I, I would say, of course, God would know that. God would know that sort of thing. God would know 
that, hey, if I'm going to tell these people to judge by the gospel, they're going to think I mean the gospel, not something else that no one has access to anymore that's been gone for six centuries. They're, they're, they're not going to get that. So, if, if, I mean, if I were writing this, I would say, hey, let me make this kind of clear here. When I say gospel, I'm referring to the original. You don't have it anymore, so don't judge by it. What you have now is not the word of God. Why would Allah, who knows that the gospel is gone and that Christians now have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why would Allah go to them and say, you have no ground to stand upon if you don't stand upon the Torah and the gospel? Why would he say that? It's just going to confuse us. Here it is 14 centuries later. I still can't get my mind around this. Judge by the gospel. You have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the gospel. According to Sammy, there's no way I can stand upon the Torah and the gospel because I don't have them. They've been corrupted. And there's no way I can judge by the gospel. I don't have it. And when I try to judge by it, it's the wrong book. It's the wrong book. Sammy says, uh, no one says that the entire Torah is corrupt. So it's no problem that Muhammad said to a copy of the Torah, I believe in you and the one who revealed you. Really. It's a corrupt book with some truth in it. And Muhammad can swear that it's the word of God. I mean, I believe that there is some truth in the Quran. It would never cross my mind to swear, I believe in the one who revealed you and in you. I believe in this book because I believe there are some things in it that are true. But according to Sammy, that's exactly what Muhammad did. He knows the Torah has been corrupted, and he swears that it's the word of God because there's some truth still in it, or even a lot of truth still in it. Muhammad is being very confusing to people like me. Right? He's saying, I believe that's the word of God even though he knows it's been corrupted, and he doesn't bother to say it's been corrupted. Sammy says that um, Muslims transmitted the Quran by oral tradition. And so it's very different from Christians who uh, transmitted the Gospels. Well, yeah, Christians use oral tradition too. It's eventually compiled uh, into the four Gospels were written. As far as not having the early manuscripts, um, you don't have the original oral transmission either. Right? And if you look at the, again, if you look at the history of the Quran, Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from four people. Abdullah ibn Masud is first on his list. How many chapters of the Quran did Abdullah ibn Masud have in his Quran? 111. How many do you have in your Quran? 114. According to Abdullah ibn Masud, Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 aren't supposed to be in the Quran. These were early prayers of Muslims. Now you can say he got it wrong, but Muhammad said, if you want to learn it from anyone, learn it from him. And he said the Quran you have today is wrong. Another person on that list of four was Ubay ibn Kaab. Ubay ibn Kaab had 116 chapters in his Quran. You have 114. He had all the chapters you have and two additional ones. So there is this early confusion. They didn't agree. And there were tons of manuscript differences. And yet, even today, I would not say the Quran has been corrupted. Why? Because I believe the message of Islam is really there. The message taught by Muhammad is really there. I believe it's there. So I wouldn't say it's been corrupted, even though you have these, these issues. But... I have to say, I think it's really hypocritical to say, well, you don't have the original manuscript of the Bible, therefore you just can't trust anything that's written. If, if that's the case, I have to reject Islam as well. And so if we're going to apply a consistent standard here, we have to say, all right, uh, according to the Quran, no one can corrupt Allah's word. Allah's word is the gospel. doesn't make sense to say, well, it was at one time, but now it's been corrupted. No one can corrupt Allah's word. And so again, if I take this book seriously, I have to believe in Jesus, and if I take Jesus seriously, I can't believe this book. Okay, we come to the half an hour of uh, questions. We're going to do this. We're going to start with a question for Sammy and then go for a question to David and then back to Sammy. They have two minutes to respond if the question's to them, and then the other person has one minute. Okay, so if you could, is this a question about questions or is this the question? It's a question. Okay, good, just a minute, okay. <laughs> There's two ways, we're going to take some written questions, so if you want to hand those in, we'll read them out and we can answer it that way, or if you would like some people to stand and ask the question as well. So if you want to hand questions in, pass them to the side and someone will come and collect them. So we'll, we'll start with a spoken question. So, and this is coming to Sam. So, um, we'll start here. Sam, I'd like to know how you can prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Please speak up. Oh, sorry. Speak up. 
How can you prove Jesus did not rise from the dead as the Jews claim his body had been stolen from the grave? May the Lord have mercy on them for the error of their ways. And his body has never been discovered. He returned to the disciples, and I believe it was Matthew's gospel, within his, in his resurrection body as opposed to his physical body. And to prove that, he asked them to give him something to eat piece of honeycomb of broiled fish to prove that he wasn't a ghost. By the time the Roman soldiers got to him, his heart, his heart had already been broken. Because when his side was pierced, there was what flowed out was hemopericardium, which surrounds the fluid that surrounds the heart. And you claim that an imposter took Jesus' can you, place. Can you finish the question? Because you're going to take longer than the three minutes. <laughs> How did an imposter have taken his place under the watchful eye of the Roman army? Right. Thank you. All right, so how did, uh, how did someone uh, take Jesus' place? Very simple. If uh, God makes someone look like Jesus, are you saying the Roman eyes are stronger than God's power? So that would be the number one. And I can ask you a question. According to you, Jesus is God. So how can a Roman kill God? That seems far more far-fetched than God saving a prophet rather than God getting killed by a bunch of human Romans who he created. So how can God get killed by the person he made and the one he's going to judge later? But anyway, as to the first point as well, how can I prove that Jesus did not rise from the dead? Uh, very simple. You're making the claim that he did rise from the dead and all the evidence isn't strong. For example, you talk about an empty tomb. An empty tomb does not, necessi does not necessitate a resurrection. There's so many reasons why a tomb could be empty without somebody being raised from the dead. If you went to a morgue today to find a dead guy and his body was missing, would you say, oh, he must have rose from the dead? No. Secondly, you assume that, that, that those stories are true, the empty tomb. I don't believe those stories are true. And how do you know they're not true? Because they're filled with contradictions within them. There, go read them for yourself. Each story about the empty tomb adds things that, are in, that aren't in the other account. You'd think that an account from God would have a consistent story, but each story contradicts the other. What does that tell you? That it's not authentic. People are simply making this up to fit their own theological belief uh, that Jesus supposedly rose from the dead. So I don't believe the empty tomb accounts are authentic. Why? Because they're filled with contradictions. If this was a book of God, I'd expect there to be consistency and no contradictions. If, you know, contradictions are from humans, not from God. And that would be my response. Thank you, Sam. One minute for David to respond to the question. Well, that. That's a lot to respond to here, so I'll, I'll go ahead and hit a, a couple points. Um, Regarding Sammy's claim that if God wanted to, he could trick everyone into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion, I agree completely. God wants to trick you that I'm speaking here when I'm really somewhere else or in the Bronx or something like that. God can do that. Um, the question is, why would God do that knowing that he's about to inadvertently start the largest false religion in history based on the idea that Jesus died for the sins of the world? Why would God do that knowing what he's about to do? What's the reason for it? Why, according to Islam, did God trick people into believing that Jesus died on the cross? There's no point to it. There's no point to it, and all that happened is Christianity came out of it. So, uh, and, and by the way, the corruption of the gospel came out of it, right? Sammy says the gospel has been corrupted. I open up my gospel, Jesus died by crucifixion. Where did that idea come from? Allah. Allah corrupted the gospel. Don't blame Paul. Allah did it. Um, no, uh, I was going to go into some other things, but I'm up on my time. This is a very succinct answer. So we now move to a question for David. Question to David, please. Okay, at the back is the first bit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think, okay, can, uh, you, can you speak up? Okay, uh, Sam brought up a point earlier on about, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big point that uh, how could Jesus forgive sins if, um, if, he, if, he, um, if, if, he, if he wasn't crucified at the time? And I just want to know what, what David responds to that because I think, like, like as you said, it is pretty fundamental. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to Christianity, so I, I don't know, and, and, and I don't think that should be here. Okay, sure, no problem. Um, well, 
first of all, I mean, as a Christian, even even if I didn't have an answer to this, I'll get to the answer in a moment. Um, even if I didn't have an answer, I would still be stuck with, I open the Bible, Jesus says he's going to die, then we have the records of Jesus dying, and the alternative that the Muslims are presenting is, no, God tricked a bunch of people into believing that. Um, I, would, I wouldn't go with that alternative, and so I, you know, the Christian kind of looks at this and says, well, all the historical evidence we have tells us Jesus died on the cross. Um, <clears throat> historical scholar, Art Ehrman, the, the Jesus Seminar, even critical scholars, uh, say not only that Jesus died by crucifixion, but that his, uh, the crucifixion is one of the best established facts of ancient history. Um, so I look at that and say, does it really make sense to say that, you know, he, you know, it's just all been, uh, it was invented by Allah, it was invented by God, God just tricked people. I mean, if you're going to resort to that kind of explanation, yeah, I'm, get, I'm getting to it, I'm going to get it to it. I'm just going to say, even, even if there weren't, even if there weren't a, a biblical solution, but what we, what we have is, the biblical position on this would be, this was God's plan all along. God, from the beginning, from before creation, knows that people are going to sin, right? God isn't bound by time. He doesn't look and say, oh, I want to forgive this person, but later on Jesus is going to die, so i, I, I got a, really, a real problem here. God isn't bound by time. Jesus, the sacrifice, was planned from before creation ever happened. So when people in the Old Testament were forgiven, when Jesus said to people, your sins are forgiven, um, a biblically, biblically, those people are only forgiven because Jesus died on the cross for sins. So on the judgment day, on the judgment day, God can forgive people at any at, at any point. But if He's forgiven them, payment has to be made for the sin, and that that happened at the cross. So God's not bound by time. Oh, Jesus is going to die 30 years from now. I don't know how I'm going to forgive people now. Um, but according to the Bible, God's justice is so perfect, all sin has to be punished. Uh, according to the Bible, God loves people so much, He's willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, and so the, the only way that all sin can be punished is at the cross, and that's, that's the, that would be the biblical perspective. One minute for you on a question that started with something that you, you'd said. So. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, uh, I don't think that response makes any sense. But anyway, even if you say God is timeless and whatever, you could forgive sin because the crucifixion was going to happen later. The fact is, people were still forgiven without sin. Uh, without the cross and that's also timeless God was timelessly according to wood forgiving people without a crucifixion you know people could still be forgiven without the cross that's a fundamental point and that's what even Judaism teaches there's no concept in Judaism that says oh yeah God can forgive our sins now because 2,000 years later or timelessly a Messiah is gonna die for us so David has to harmonize his answer with the Jewish Bible as well, not just simply his belief. And as for Bart Ehrman, Bart Ehrman says the crucifixion happened, but he says the resurrection didn't. And that's fundamental to Christianity as well, not just the crucifixion. Okay, but if there are any written questions that have come your way to the end of the rose, can you please raise your hand? Any written questions anywhere? Can you pass them to the end and then uh, someone will collect them? While well, they're being collected in, we'll take a question for Sammy. So, we have some... Okay. Yeah, question regarding, you know, where Jesus says, I'll be with you to the end of the age. You said it's not actually Jesus himself that's going to be with us at the end of the age. You said it's his words, his message. Well, how is his word or his message going to be with us at the end of the age? It's been corrupted that we don't have it anymore. Right, wait for the answer before you start clapping. <laughs> uh, because the Quran answers that question. The Quran says that the true believer, the true believers of Jesus and the ones who will continue to uphold his message are the Muslims as well. So that's how Jesus' teachings are preserved in the Quran, which came to correct the false teachings that were ascribed to him. So that's how they would remain. And secondly, as for the people in his lifetime. Uh, the way Jesus would remain with them is if they kept his truthful teachings separate from the corrupt. That's how you would keep it. Muslims are followers of Jesus. You know, Christians aren't the only followers of Jesus. There's a billion Muslims who believe in Jesus. And that's how his message continues to be preserved. In the Quran, it tells us about the message of Jesus. And so that's how... He stays, his, his teachings remain relevant because the Quran has absolved him of the corruptions that were given in his name. So that's how it would remain. And last but not least, 
forget what the Quran says. Uh, that's your own problem anyway. For example, yeah, why would Jesus say to keep his teachings till the end of the age if his words got corrupted? That's that's actually a problem for you, not for me. Because it's, it's your book that's telling you to follow his teachings, but those same teachings are corrupt as well. For example, Jesus in the Gospels supposedly said that the world was going to come to an end. He said it's going to come to an end in your generation. So now you tell me, how do you harmonize that problem? Because that seems like a big problem. Because 2,000 years later, we're all still sitting here and um, Jesus is nowhere to be seen. And since Wood quoted Ehrman, Bart Ehrman even says that Jesus was an uh, apocalyptic prophet who taught that the end of the world should have happened 2,000 years ago. Thank you. Okay, there's one, one minute to respond. Uh, I think this is a very important question because the, the idea here is when you make a claim uh, about what people have done, corrupting the gospel or something like that, you're not just telling me about the people. You're telling me something about God. You're telling me something about Jesus. Uh, for instance, when Jesus says um, that he's going to be with his followers till the end of the age and he just means his teachings, I say, wow, your followers didn't get that. That means you're not a very good, uh, you're not a very good communicator because no one ever got that. No one ever got that. They assume that he's with them. Jesus is actually with them as he claimed. And when you tell me that his message was corrupted, you're telling me something about God. Because God, according to the Quran even, delivered the, the gospel as a guidance. Who did it guide? And the, the Islamic answer is, uh, from, from Sami's perspective, it was corrupted in part by Allah. And people just didn't have it anymore. But yes, the, the problem arises. How is Jesus going... How, how, how is Jesus' message even going to be with them when it got corrupted in part by Allah? Thank you. I had two questions. Thankfully, one was for David and one was for Sam. Um, so, question to David. You said in Matthew 25, Jesus was the Son of Man, but judges everyone, i.e. is God. And the question is, if Jesus was dead for three days, who was ruling the world for those three days? And with a follow-up, it can't have been much of a sacrifice if Jesus knew he would rise in three days. Um, also, Jesus is dead again now, so God is dead. Uh, could you just... Uh, I'll, let's go for the two. I was, re I was resetting the clock, so could you... Okay, if briefly? Jesus was dead for three days, who was ruling the world for those three days? And it can't have been much of a sacrifice if Jesus knew he would rise in three days. We'll leave the God is dead theology for another question. Okay, thank you for asking that question. Okay, uh, as far as um, Jesus was dead for three days, uh, who was ruling the world? Let me give you a, a brief answer that, that I'll, I'll try to, to, to give an Islamic perspective. Um, this is the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Muslims tell me that the Quran is the eternal word of Allah, the eternal speech of Allah. It has no beginning, uh, cannot be corrupted, cannot be destroyed. You remember, uh, a year or two ago, a guy down in Florida burned one of these and I will ask you, how can someone burn Allah's eternal word? How can someone burn Allah's <laughs> burn eternal word? word? <laughs> that's, where, that's where I'm going. That's, where, that's, that's exactly where I'm going. Is this a Quran or is this not a Quran? Yes, it is a Quran. And the correct answer, according to Islamic theology, is that the Quran has two natures. It, is, it has an eternal nature, uncorrupted, uh, perfect, eternal. It enters our world as a physical Quran made of paper and glue and ink, which has a publication date. This physical nature of the Quran can be corrupted, can be destroyed, but no Muslim would say if someone burns the Quran, the eternal word of Allah has been destroyed. Now, given that's Islamic theology, how do you object when Christians open up the New Testament and it says in John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and since the eternal Word took on a physical nature as Jesus of Nazareth, that physical nature can then die on the cross, even though Jesus' eternal nature does not die. How do you say that's ridiculous without also saying that the Islamic view of something eternal taking on a physical nature which can be destroyed, uh, how, that, wouldn't that also be absurd? As far as uh, Jesus uh, knowing that he was going to rise, and therefore it's not much of a sacrifice, um, seriously, if I tell you I'm going to torture you to death right now, but you're going to you're going to come back later, that's no problem then. So okay, who cares? I'm going to come back later anyway. Really, really, is is, is it that meaningless? Uh, I don't think it is. 
Well, actually, it is meaningless because you just said Jesus is also eternal. So if I also know I'm eternal and I'm going to get sacrificed, that's not really a sacrifice because I'm still existing eternally. So even while I'm getting tortured, I'm still going to be eternal. So it's not really much of a big deal. You know, I am God according to you. So where's the sacrifice in that? And as for Jesus becoming uh, flesh in the God, that's all nice from John. But uh, where did Jesus ever say that? Where did Jesus ever say that I am God in the flesh and that I exist uh, eternally and now I'm coming to limit myself and so forth and so forth? Jesus never said those things. You know, those are, uh, as I said, interpolations that people are uh, theologically interpreting these things upon Jesus. Jesus never said that. So who are you going to believe? John or Jesus who never said that? So there's the second written question which uh, comes back to you, Sam. It's asking for your response on this statement. And it is, Jesus started to forgive sins while he walked on the earth. This was fulfilled in his crucifixion and resurrection later. Surely this makes sense. All right, no, not really, because I, I don't see how that makes any sense. Jesus forgave sin, and that was fulfilled on the cross. The fulfillment of forgiving sin actually happened when he said, you are forgiven. It didn't say, okay, I'm forgiving you now, and then this will be fulfilled on the cross. You see, now you, whoever asked that question, has put that theological interpolation into it. If you plainly read the text, Jesus simply says, I forgive your sin. It's not followed by any other statement saying, oh, because timelessly I've already been crucified and the sin will be forgiven later as a fulfillment while I'm on the cross. Jesus keeps, uh, David keeps saying, well, Jesus must have been a very bad communicator. Well, uh, if you take the Gospels for the, what they are, then in your theology he must be a very bad communicator because he never said those things. Everything David just said earlier about the crucifixion being timeless Jesus never said that. What you just asked, uh, Jesus fulfilling, forgiving someone's sin, Jesus never said that. I don't believe that because Jesus never said that. So I guess, per the Gospels, he is a bad communicator because I don't see any of those things to which you're claiming. In fact, I'll, I'll put it right on the table. Please bring me a single verse, David Woods, bring me a single verse where Jesus said, I can forgive sin right now, because it will be fulfilled in uh, the cross, or bring me another statement where Jesus said, I am God and man, and now I've come to the earth as man, and then bring me the other verse where Jesus said that the reason why sin can be forgiven is because I've been timelessly crucified. Just bring those points, because that's what you're saying. Bring those points. I said the most important commandment according to Jesus is that there's one God. Guess what? I brought it for you. So bring me the verses, not the, uh, theology. It's three verses or four verses in one minute. Yeah, that's a lot to do in one minute. I'll try to go rapid fire here. Um, Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will uh, worship him. Not, not who we're supposed to be worshiping. Um, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So the Lamb is, this is planned from the beginning. This is not me. This is the scripture that Sammy has challenged. Uh, as far as uh, Jesus' claim to be God, just very simply, go to the Quran, Surah 57, verse 3. It refers to God as the first and the last. If you go to uh, the book of Isaiah 44, 6, it refers to God, it refers to Yahweh as the first and the last. So Allah is the first and the last, Yahweh is the first and the last. Why? Nothing before him, nothing can come after him. We open up, we open up the book of Revelation, and we find Jesus say, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of hate. One year block. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a question for Sammy, yeah. sorry, for David, <laughs> and I'm going to take a question in the back, for, no, for you in the brown hijab, yeah, my dimbleby moment there. <laughs> yeah, I, have a, I have a question for David, um, and it's about justice in Christianity. What's that? Justice in okay. Christianity. You say that Jesus was crucified on the cross uh, as a form of justice for people's sins. So 
So as long as I'm a Christian and I accept Jesus as God, then I can do pretty much whatever I want because Jesus died for my sins. That doesn't sound like justice to me because a murderer and a rapist and a thief can do whatever they want and as long as they accept Jesus, then that's okay because he died for their sins. How is that justice? Um, no, that would be that would be a, a misinterpretation. That would be a misinterpretation of what Christianity teaches. Um, uh, yes, the sacrifice of Jesus is required for uh, for forgiveness uh, because payment has to be made. If God's going to forgive you, and if if someone is perfect, ima imagine a judge around here, right? And he says, eh, "You've committed some crimes, but I'm going to let you go." You would say, "Hey, that's a very nice judge," but you wouldn't say he his justice is perfect. Uh, Christians believe that if God is perfect, he's also perfect in his attributes. Uh, if his justice is perfect, he can't let any sin slide. And that's part of the message of Christianity is at the end of time, all sin has been punished, either on the person himself or uh, with the sacrifice of Christ. Now, as far as uh, since Jesus has paid the price for your sins, you can just go around and do whatever you want. Uh, let me read the, the actual Christian position. Uh, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him is the love of God perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So according to this passage, if you say, hey, I, I know Jesus, therefore I'm good to go. I get to sin all I want. You don't actually know Jesus. You're not really a Christian. Mm -hmm. the, what the Christian message is is, I mean, think about the morality you're just claiming. If it doesn't have to do with salvation, you have no reason at all to be good. I do the right, if, if, I, if I find a wallet on the ground, hey, I need money, I can take it. I'm not going to, why? Not because, oh, God's not going to let me into heaven if I don't. No, it's, that's the right thing to do. Christians obey God out of our love for God, not because we get a bunch of stuff in heaven. So when I do the right thing, and I hope this is true of lots of you Muslims in here, it's not just, oh, I can get another virgin in heaven or something like that. It's actually, this is what God wants me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. So we are saved, we are forgiven through Jesus' sacrifice. We obey God out of love for God. So if you sin, you can't be a Christian. Okay, I think you'll have to ask him afterwards, I think. You have to follow that out as much as we'd like to. So Sammy's got a minute on uh, Christians and justice on the cross. All right, well, I don't think it is justice because David says God has to be just. Well, if I commit a sin and God says, well, now Bob is going to take the punishment, is that justice? You've basically taken my crime and put it on somebody else just so you can say, hey, somebody's taken the punishment. That's not punishment, nor is that just. True justice is punishing the actual person who committed the crime not uh, somebody who didn't commit the crime, an innocent person. How's that just? We as humans even sometimes feel uh, disgusted when we read the story about an innocent man who takes the punishment of the criminal. So that's not uh, justice at all. That's injustice, blaming an innocent person for the sin of Hitler. Think about it that way. So if, Hitler, if God comes to Hitler and says, do you feel bad for what you did? Do you blame Jesus for your sin? And he says, yes. Hitler is absolved, and Jesus becomes Hitler. He takes on his sin. How's that just? Any last intake of written questions before we go to the We'll take a spoken question for Sammy. And let me think. We had a Muslim speaker, so uh, I'm not sure which place you're coming from, but I'm, I like the look of you today. <laughs> um, um, Sammy, you quote E.P. Sanders. Um, presumably you think it's a... Is it the is it real Jesus book, I'm guessing? Um, I think it's on page 120-ish at the bottom. E.P. Sanders says that um, the main message of Jesus was the fact that there's a kingdom coming and a kingdom to come, and that he's going to be king. How do you reconcile with that, the claims in the Old Testament, where um, God, God uh, Yahweh, says in 1 Samuel 8, 6 that he's the king of his people? How do you reconcile these two statements? Right, so E.P. Sanders, basically, he's one of the most uh, known, well-known well scholars on the historical Jesus. And according to E.P. Sanders, the real message of Jesus was that he was actually an apocalyptic uh, prophet who was teaching that he was going to be the king 2,000 years ago, that God's kingdom was supposed to happen 
2,000 years ago and Jesus would rule over the people in Palestine. Because if you read the Gospels, Jesus says <coughs> that the end will come within that generation. So scholars who aren't biased read that for what it is and say Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. Now, ask for the question, but God is the king, so how can Jesus be the king as well? Well, as E.P. Sanders would teach in Judaism, God is the king, but the Messiah is God's representative on earth. It is a kingdom of God. Jesus is the king, but in essence, in totality, everything is for God. It's a kingdom of God, and Jesus is the leader, you could say, of that kingdom. But he's not the ultimate leader, as E.P. Sanders would also teach. Because in Judaism, who is the Son of Man? The Son of Man is spoken in Daniel, and he's a representative of God. God would give him a kingdom, and he'd rule that kingdom under God. That's why it's even called the kingdom of God. Nobody believes, except uh, Christians, that when Jesus is the king, it's because he's the ultimate God. The Jews don't believe that. Historical scholars don't believe that. When Jesus is the king, he's basically a king and representative under God and under God's authority. That's how E.P. Sanders explains it. That's how the Old Testament explains it. And that's how Jews explain it and so on. Um, Jesus doesn't say... All authority on earth has been given to me. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that's a problem. See, you can say from a critical perspective, right? You can say from a critical scholarly perspective, hey, here's a scholar that rejects that. Great, I can find scholars that say all kinds of things. I can find scholars that say, um, Muhammad never existed. Doesn't mean I believe them. Um, but what? I'm not talking to an atheist. I'm not talking to a liberal Christian scholar. I'm not talking. I'm talking to a Muslim, right? If Sammy were to say, I don't believe in the resurrection because miracles are impossible, I would not give a historical defense of the resurrection at that point. I would say, what are you talking about? You're a Muslim. You, how can you reject something by not believing in miracles, right? You're a Muslim. Similarly, when we start talking about, oh, the gospel's been changed, and this has been changed, and that's been changed, and this is all gone, a Muslim, as I've shown from the Quran, is not supposed to be saying that. So if Sammy wants to become an atheist and come back and use some of these objections, fine, I'll deal with those objections. Right now, his Quran says something very different from what he's saying to us. We've got a question, so we're going to move to David for a full question. I'm going to invite you to speak. Okay, so David, you said he chose the word eat as he rose from the dead, and it makes Fascinating story. The theory of evolution can you seem as an even more fascinating tale. So, through this logic, surely you would take theory of evolution over the word Jesus. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let me just review uh, becoming uh, becoming a Christian. Right? Issues of evolution. Would I mean, if God created the revolution, they created the revolution. If He created some other way, then He created some other way. Um, on any of these views, Jesus can still rise from the dead. So it's not like you pick one, right? Pick, Jesus either rose from the dead, you believe that, or you believe something else. Uh, as far as the resurrection of Jesus, every shred of evidence we have, every shred of historical evidence we have, tells us Jesus died by crucifixion. We have Jewish sources, we have Christian sources, we have Roman sources. Uh, critical scholars across the board, even uh, people like Barty Arman, that's why I quoted him, not to say I believe him, I think Barty Arman's wrong on a lot of stuff. Um, I quote him to say, look, even a guy who disagrees with us on a lot of stuff, <clears throat> thinks we're nuts, agrees that Jesus' death by crucifixion didn't. It's not just that it happened. He thinks it's probably happened. He says it's one of the best established facts of history. And according to Islam, why is it one of the best established facts of ancient history? Because Allah did such a great job tricking everyone. I can't accept that kind of explanation. I'm not going to allow you to bring an omnipotent deceiver into the equation, because if there's an omnipotent <laughs> deceiver, I can't believe anything. I don't know what he's tricking me about at any moment. So I have to take it as historically certain that Jesus died. The question is, what happened after Jesus died? Even scholars like Bart Ehrman, who reject the resurrection, even all kinds of other, uh, all kinds across the board, they all agree that Jesus' disciples at least claimed that he had appeared to them, right? That's not saying he rose, that's saying these guys claimed it and they believed it. And some people will say, well, it must have been some kind of hallucination or what. 
Uh, as for me, I'm only giving my, per my, my personal perspective here. I sat there and looked at that and say, what explains the fact that Jesus was dead and the fact that all these people are claiming that he was alive again after he was dead and went to their horrible bloody deaths? People can die, even today, for something they believe in, right? A Muslim can die for what he believes in. Christian can die for what he believes in. Um, but the point is, if we're dying for something, then we believe it. We, we have to believe it. You're not dying for something you know you made up. The disciples were dying, horrible, bloody deaths for the claim, not that they heard something from someone else, but that they had witnessed the risen Jesus. And I had asked myself, what could have convinced them to that extent that they had seen the risen Jesus? The only answer I could come up with was they actually saw him. So he was dead, he was alive again, he rose from the dead. That's God's stamp of approval. Amen. Yeah. Samuel, your own right of reply. All right, saying Bart Ehrman believes in the crucifixion is quite a deceptive argument. Or saying any historian who's not Christian believes in the crucifixion, that doesn't mean much because they don't believe in the resurrection. And what did Paul say? Paul said Christianity is based on the resurrection. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your faith is in vain. So who cares if they said he, rose, he got crucified? They don't say he rose from the dead. And that's what really matters. So even though they say he was on the cross, they don't say he rose from the dead. So that completely works against you. And there are millions of people who said they, they've seen uh, visions or someone who's supposed to be dead. Millions of Catholics say they see the Virgin Mary. Dr. James White will tell you all about that. So should we believe them now? just because they said uh, they saw Mary. And more to the point, there's actually no source in the New Testament that says those disciples were getting killed because they believed in Jesus' resurrection. Thank you. Right, I'm gonna, we're just going to have two more questions. I'm going to take a question from a Christian to Sammy and a Muslim to David, and then each of them can have a minute, a good timekeepers, to just make their final remarks. So... I hope you're all Christians. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, straight in the center. Yeah, with a stripy shirt pointing yourself. That's great. No, it's yeah. you. Oh, it's okay. definitely you. <laughs> okay. Um, you said that the Quran for sure refers to, to the Gospels. And uh, everybody here believes that's for more for history. To history. I want to ask a question. Is, if, if Quran is a historical book, then what kind of Gospel or Torah Quran refer? historically and if Muhammad had access to this Torah and, and gospel then what kind of Torah gospel Muhammad had access historically and he's ex-Muslim <laughs> all right when the Quran refers to the original or the true Torah and gospel the one that completely affirms the Torah is the original one that was given to Moses the gospel was the original one given to Jesus. That's what it's referring to. Now, when the prophet sometimes picked up the Torah of his time, he wasn't affirming the whole book. He was affirming the truth in it. Because we as Muslims believe that the Torah has a divine uh, revelation behind it. We don't believe that it was completely man-made. So we will affirm some parts of the Torah today, but we don't affirm that the entire book is authentic from God. But the entire authentic book from God is the original one that was given to Moses, that was given to Jesus. And since you're asking a historical, historical question, it's a historical fact, which is not disputed by anybody, that we don't have the original gospel, nor do we have the original Torah. So when I say that there used to be an original text, which is the one the Quran is referring to, and we, don't know, we no longer have that original text, what we have are probably some partial uh, truths from it, that's a historical fact. There's no historian who isn't biased that believes the modern day New Testament that we have is the authentic uh, manuscript or the authentic text from Jesus or his disciples. We don't have it. And we don't even have the original manuscripts. We don't even have a copy of the original. So it's not even the original text. So we don't, we don't completely affirm its divine nature. We say some part of it is true, but we don't say the entire part of it is true. 
Thank you. I've made a decision, I think, as there are seemingly, I could be wrong, very few Christian women in the house. The last question goes to a Muslim Don't woman. Don't I get a quick response? Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to write. Yeah, you've got your response. Um, all right, Sammy uh, says that, again, that the Quran only affirms the original Torah and the Gospel. Again, that would be fine if the Quran only said Surah 3, 3 through 4. But he tells us we have no ground to stand upon if we don't stand upon the Gospel. He tells Christians we're supposed to judge by the Gospel. How can I obey the Quran? How can I judge by the Gospel? We don't have it anymore because we don't have the originals according to Sammy. We don't have the originals of the Quran either, so we can't judge by the Quran. I don't know what we're going to do, but think about this. Allah is telling me to judge by a book that I don't have. He's calling me a rebel who's hell-bound if I don't judge by it, and I don't even have it. So no matter what I do, I'm just in all kinds of trouble. Uh, he says, uh, it's a historical fact that we don't have the originals. Again, it's a historical fact that we don't have the original Quran. He says, no historian who, who, who isn't biased says that these things go back uh, to the original disciples. And what does he mean by unbiased? Does he mean non-Christian? Because I would challenge him then to show me some non-Muslims who say the Quran is the authoritative word of God. If that's, I mean, if that's your, again, we have to be consistent here. Thank you. Okay, so on grounds of gender balance, the last question goes to a woman, and there's been one from the back, so I'll go for that. Um, yeah, my question is, um, we've kind of got lost in this debate about, you know, arguing over verses from Revelations, which is right at the end of the Bible, and, you know, whatever. But we're talking about the message of Muhammad and the message of Jesus. Now, if you believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and I assume because the Bible that you read has the Old Testament and the New Testament in it, all the prophets in the Old Testament, they, like the story is, they come, they tell, they teach their people about the oneness of God and how to worship Him. The commandments are the same, you know, all the prophets bring that same message. And then, you know, Abraham, um, Moses, all the prophets, they had that same message. And then Jesus came and He said, I've come in the Bible, I've come to reaffirm what was before us. And then, so that assumes that the message is the same, that there is still one God. The Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, they also taught the same message. So if we're arguing about the message throughout the Bible, and I've read it cover to cover, I'll admit it, it's that there is one God and the way to follow him is to follow his messengers. And how did Jesus pray? How did he stress? Can, can you focus this into one question? Yeah, so us? my question is, Basically, how do you, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, there's clear contradiction in the Bible in terms of your saying that Jesus said that he was the son of God and he taught. But that's a very minor part of the whole Bible, which is that there is one God and that we should worship the one God. So how do you reconcile that in your head? Well, I would say if you're interpreting the Christian claim as there's more than one God, that's not the claim at all. We believe in one God. Jesus preached one God. That's why I didn't challenge it when Sammy said, but Jesus said there's only one God. And absolutely, Jesus said there's only one God. Uh, you referred to the Old Testament prophets and said, well, they all just preach the same thing. I don't know what Old Testament you're reading. The Old Testament prophets said someone who is coming, who's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, Yahweh is speaking, and he says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced. When did they pierce God? When did they pierce God? Isaiah 53, where it says someone is going to die for the sins of, the, for the, for the sins of others. What, is, is that the same message? Because if so, if that's the message, if, that's, if the Old Testament is the message, then I still have to reject the Quran, because none of that lines up uh, with Islam. So uh, as far as the, the, the consistent message, what you have is in the Old Testament, everyone's pointing forward. There's someone coming. There's someone coming. There's someone coming. Jesus finally comes along. In fact, we'll go back before Jesus. John the Baptist, when Jesus comes along, says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of Amen. the world. It's John the Baptist, right? So that's a prophet before Jesus. And that's what you find in the Old Testament. Someone's coming who's going to be God with us, who's going to be the sacrifice for sins. And Jesus comes along, says, I'm here, and some people rejected him, some people didn't get it, some people didn't understand how to piece these things together. But, I mean, at the end of the day, the difference between Jesus' followers and the people who rejected him was, because, guess what, you know, Peter and the apostles uh, were, in, were, were taught the same sorts of things as the people who rejected Jesus. The difference was, 
Jesus' followers said, look at all the miracles this guy's performing. He rose from the dead. Even if, this, even if I can't put all this together right now, I'm going to believe whatever he says. He says that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. He claimed to be the I am of the accident. I mean, the, 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 the great I am. He claimed to be the final judge. All these things, sorry, I have to believe that. And that's the position I would have. I'm not going to stubbornly reject him because I don't like something he says. <laughs> Um, that's basically taking the Jewish book and just making up stuff along the way because the Jews had that book for 2,000 years and they don't believe in any of what you just said. Were they just stupid or are you arrogant enough to say that the evangel evangelicals came along and that you understand the uh, true message? In fact, just go to a Jewish website, Jews for Judaism. They have a response to every point he brought up, such as someone is coming, someone is coming. Well, who did the Jews say that person was? Sometimes it referred to Israel. Sometimes it referred to someone who already came during the time the text was written. So when you say someone is coming, and that must refer to Jesus, even though nobody at the time believed that, something seems wrong here. So it's true. The Old Testament says a lot of things, but it doesn't say what you believe, because if it did, then why don't the holders of the book, to this day, believe what you're saying? Thank you. I'll give each of the speakers... I'll give each of the speakers a minute just to make some final remarks. Sorry and apologies to those of you who still want to ask questions. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. So, um, Sam is just gone, so we'll go to David. Just one minute. Well, for me, the, the, the issue is a fundamental one of consistency. Um, I don't see a consistent methodology. I'm saying here's what the Bible says, here's what the Quran says, the Quran affirms the Bible, let's look and see if we can reconcile these, and we can't, and therefore they're different messages. Uh, Sammy just is not consistent. He says, uh, well, Jews rejected. Jews, if, if that message were true, Jews would have accepted it. Did, did, did these Jews accept Islam? Some Jews have accepted Islam, but some Jews accepted Christianity. So is that standard fair? Uh, Muslims, Muslims seem to agree when Sammy said, uh, it's unjust and unfair for someone to die for the sins of another. I suggest you read Sahih Muslim uh, 6665 through 6668, all of which say uh, that Allah is going to punish Jews and Christians for the sins of Muslims. If you don't believe me, I'll read it real quick. Uh, Sahih Muslim, number 6665. When it will be the day of resurrection, Allah will deliver to every Muslim or Jew, a, uh, uh, every Muslim, a Jew or a Christian, and say, that is your rescue from hellfire. Going to put the sins on the backs of uh, on the backs of the Jews and Christians. That's not me. And you don't like it. You don't. You see a prophet talking, which means you haven't submitted, as the Quran tells you to submit. Just as you haven't submitted, if you say the, to the, the Torah and the Gospel have been corrupted, it can't happen according to Islam. Thank you. Sammy, you lost a minute. All right. There is nothing in the Hadiths that say anything about anyone else atoning for Muslim sin, and I'll challenge. <laughs> Just, read <laughs> Just read it. Just read it. No, yeah, if I had time to explain it, uh, you want me to quote your Bible in Luke 19.27, it says a king will come back and kill everybody. So your Bible commits, uh, causes genocide, calls for genocide. It's there in the Bible. But now you're going to say, but it means that. So let's not play silly games. If you want to take a small text and say, oh, it means all of that, then I can play that game much better than you. I mean, we can bring up so many things in the Old Testament talking about uh, ripping babies out of the wombs. It's there. It's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the text. So anyway, the main message today. Now, I asked David to bring up verses from the Bible of Jesus' lips, and he didn't bring any. Because the book of Revelations, it's beyond a joke to even say that the book of Revelations are the words of Jesus. Even early Christians rejected the book of Revelations. There's nobody who believes that the book of Reve Revelations is an actual historical document of Jesus' lips or what he said. So your strongest evidence to Jesus being God, that I'm going to die for your sins or that I can forgive sins because it's timeless, because I am man and God, comes from the book of Revelations, which nobody takes seriously as an authentic account of Jesus' life. So in tonight's debate... You haven't brought any verse where Jesus says, I am man and God. The only verse you brought up where Jesus says, I will die for the sins of the world. I don't say it's false, but academia says it's false. Now, if you want to reject academia, that's all good with me. But that really says it all, that you have to reject academia 
to support your beliefs, and that's a big problem. Even Imperial College's academia would reject his beliefs. I'd like to thank the speakers. They are, these are just the best timekeeping speakers I have ever seen in 10 years at Imperial College. Uh, give them a big round of applause. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the questions.